Hey everyone, geophysicist Stefan Burns here. We have a big solar storm impact coming in soon. Check out this differential imagery of that explosion right there. That is headed towards Earth. The estimate right now is that this will trigger a G3 geomagnetic storm. The scale rating goes from one to five. A G3 level is a strong storm, or sometimes they call it a major storm. And you can see that that was a huge explosion on the sun. We can also see that here with our differential coronagraph view. So you'll notice that at the beginning of this video, we get this nice double explosion. Effect effectively, we're seeing the shock wave from that big explosion, and then we see the bulk of the plasma falling up behind it. So there's a shock wave and there's the bulk. Do you see that? That is headed to Earth right now at this moment in time because this was from a explosion on the sun, exactly Earth direct. And super interesting thing about this solar flare is that it occurred exactly at the same time as a magnitude seven earthquake in Alaska. And Alaska was on the daylight side of the Earth being impacted by those light photons. And there have been 100 plus aftershocks now from that magnitude seven earthquake. We will talk about that more. We'll talk about when we expect this impact to come in, the aurora viewing possibilities for the United States and Europe, and so much more in today's video. Let's start with some high def imagery of these two solar explosions. Boom shakalaka, there is that 8.1 M-class flare that exploded from the sun yesterday, a 1.1 M-class flare just before that. A bit of an appetizer, a teaser for what may yet to come. And this sunspot group is still Earth direct, so it very well could launch more activity our way in the next 24, 48, 72 hours. We also have this very large sunspot group down here. It has been very inactive, though it is very large. Sunspots right now are around 160, 170. They've been there for a few days. So overall sunspot numbers are higher on the sun right now. And I'm kind of getting a feeling that this is going to rotate around the far side. And when it shows up again, if it does, then it'll be active. And that will be the very end of December, early January. So I'm just getting a sense that since it's just recently formed, it still needs time to develop, and then we're gonna see a lot of activity from that in about a month's time. But we'll have to wait and see. It actually, based off of this position, it'd be about 25 days for it to be Earth Center and direct again. But we have this solar storm inbound from this 8.1 M-class flare, and that first 1.1 M-class flare did launch a little puff of plasma our way as well. The really interesting thing here, though, uh, it was really tremendous to see in action, absolutely epic was how that solar flare, the 8.1, was perfectly lined up in time with that 7.0 earthquake in Alaska. Let's check out the aftershocks because there's been a huge amount. Here we have our USGS latest earthquakes map set for the past day and for universal time. And we see this big magnitude seven right there. That is the largest earthquake that we've had since 1010. And that was when we had two magnitude sevens pop off on the same day. But check out these aftershocks. I mean, this is insane. So we'll uh, set to list only earthquakes on the map. And in fact, we have 152 earthquakes in this location for, for the past 24 hours. So the strongest being that, of course, main shock, magnitude seven. There is a chance that that is a foreshock, but with this sort of after swarm, I don't think that's the case. I put that probability really low, like 1% or less. There was a magnitude six earthquake nearby less than two weeks ago outside of Anchorage that had very anomalous aftershock activity in the fact that it was very, very low. There were almost no aftershocks and they weren't high magnitude. And so that was a little bit of a precursor foreshock to this big event, though it's not immediately in the same area or on the same fault system, but the overall geologic setting is the same. So speaking to some more broader regional stress dynamics that are changing for Alaska and Canada. But we see these aftershocks here, 5.1, 5.0, 5.5. Typically, the strongest aftershock would be one magnitude less than the magnitude seven, but we do have a lot of magnitude fours, uh, really endless amounts of magnitude fours. So this looks like the main aftershock sequence. Residents in this area have been reporting these jolts in a low 
vibration just kind of humming from the ground now for more than 24 hours. So this was a huge release of Earth energy as we forecasted back on December 2nd. So on December 2nd, I put out an earthquake forecast going all the way up to today, Sunday, for there being a higher probability of high magnitude earthquakes. And well, lo and behold, our first magnitude seven since October 10th. So the space weather factors are very important to look at as it relates to global seismicity and geologic events, geophysical energies here on Earth. In fact, we just saw an anomalous burst of energy in the Schumann resonances, one that's not caused from local atmospheric activity. We can check that out by going to the earthevolution.com slash energy dash analytics portal. Here we have our data on screen via the space Obser observing system. As many of you know, especially longtime viewers, I started off by looking at Schumann resonances. These are Earth's naturally resonant energy fields created by lightning strikes, ionospheric sunrise, solar flare impacts, space weather, earthquake energies. Our brain creates Schumann resonances. Their frequencies at 7.8 hertz, 14 hertz, 20 hertz, 25, 26 hertz, 33, 39, 45 hertz and they are form these standing waves that always have more energy than the background frequency. So here we see a spectrogram going from zero to 40 hertz for the past three days. So we're only seeing two days and a little bit extra data here. This is observed in Tomsk, Russia. And so we see these horizontal bands of higher intensity. Here's our power legend. This is high power, that's low power. We're measuring the vertical electric field here. So you have this gradient of electrical energy, this uh, current going from the ground surface up to the ionosphere where you have plasma from uh, geomagnetic storms and more just in general, there's a lot of energy up there. You get these vibrations nested on that current. They are the Schumann resonances. And so they show up at higher power continuously across time. Now, a lot of people are, track the Schumann resonances and there's fewer people that also do a lot of videos about the Schumann resonances, daily updates, things of that nature. 95% of those people, if not more, probably 99% of them make mistakes as to looking at local atmospheric activity and saying these are global energy changes because the observation station for the Schumann resonances, wherever it is, is also detecting, of course, the local atmospheric electrical conditions. So that's cloud cover, rain, snow, uh, thunderstorms, all these things impact that. And so you need clear weather conditions in order to pick out global signals. And global signals may not be around the entire world at once. They can also be uh, more concentrated in certain zones, especially high latitude zones, because that is where you have more influence from the space environment. So here we see this anomalous burst in the Schumann resonances. We haven't seen anything anomalous in the Schumann resonances based off the observation stations that we do have that are public. This would be Tomps, this would be Kumiana, Italy, there's a few elsewhere in months. Okay, I track this day by day. You may have been wondering why haven't I made videos on this? It's because there's nothing's been happening. Uh, everything's been local atmospheric disturbances that other people have been saying is something special. It's not. This is special because there were clear weather conditions, fair weather conditions in Tomsk at that time. I checked and this is also not at all characteristic of what we often see like this right here. That's all noise created from wind on the antenna and also you can get that from just in general like uh, more cloud cover and haze. But you see here it's nice clear conditions and you get this low frequency energy burst going from about one all the way to 10 hertz and then tapering off down into the 25 hertz zone. So that's quite bizarre. I really don't know what that is from, though it seems to be from the, uh, the, just the energetics of yesterday. We had the big solar flare, we had the magnitude seven earthquake, Kilauea had its biggest eruption yet, pretty interesting. What that may be heralding, I can't really say. Sometimes we just get these earth bursts and that's it. But that is something I wanted to bring to your attention, this anomalous burst of energy in the Schumann resonances. And if any more pop up, I will report on it for you. Now, before we get back to when we can expect this solar storm to impact in the aurora visibility for the United States and Europe, I want us to talk a little bit more about this earthquake in Alaska because there's some interesting things here. Here we see our ground visualization model. We see these surface waves immediately propagate through Alaska. Red is motion up, blue is motion down. This is the vertical displacement of the ground as measured by seismometers all across North America. So we see these 
huge waves of energy go through the United States. Now, if you're in the continental US, you're not gonna feel that, okay? Uh, because these seismographs are very sensitive. But if you're in this region, yeah, they've been feeling that energy. So it is quite remarkable how a big magnitude seven earthquake can send out this seismic energy, not only across North America, but in fact, across the entire globe. This rippled out across the entire Northern hemisphere. So that was a strong earthquake. And here's where things get interesting. We see that the epicenter of this magnitude seven earthquake, in fact, was perfectly equidistant to some main ancient sites that are on the planet. So of course the pyramids at Giza in Egypt, the Nazca lines, which are finding more and more of all the time, and also Angkor Wat. So uh, this is basically perfectly equidistant between them. You draw a circle there and well, I think that's just really interesting. I, I really don't think you can interpret into this too much, like why they're being earthquake there, how are they connected? These are really big, broad open questions but just at least to stimulate some curiosity, uh, this is great. We really don't know, for example, the age of the pyramid. Some people are very certain on the age, but there's a lot of evidence that we don't know the actual age of the pyramids, the true builders. The Nazca lines are finding new ones all the time based off of satellite imagery and artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms, being able to pick up new ones. And then there's other ancient sites around the world which also have a lot of their own mysterious qualities to them. So this magnitude seven, perhaps a little bit of a hint that we have some big revelations coming about in terms of our ancient history. Maybe it's just a coincidence. I thought I'd present this to your attention. You can uh, learn more from that person who first made this observation by going to the link in my video description and clicking on that Twitter X link. And I've also linked on my profile, so check that out. And here we see our NOAA space weather model for that CME launch from that 8.1 M-class flare. Direct shot to Earth. This is our top down view. That's the sun, this is the Earth. This is our south north view, so our vertical view. So often we'll see these solar storms go like this. It's like, oh wow, it's gonna hit us, but it's actually going to the south or to the north. This one, even though it launched from the northern hemisphere, was angled down to the south. So we see a direct hit there and at a pretty good velocity. Here we're looking at the velocity. This is the plasma density. Same story down here, just showing you how fast it's going. So we're expected to get this sudden bump in the velocity of the solar wind from that solar storm impact and then a sudden jump in the plasma density. Sometimes you don't get both of those two combined together. So a G3 geomagnetic storm is expected from this according to NOAA and I think that's pretty much spot on. I could see this being mostly a G2 storm within some G3 uh, conditions active at times. Of course, it's not gonna last like three days or anything, but I think the peak of this storm could go to G3 levels very easily. And in fact, GFC Potsdam out of Europe and Germany, they expect this to go even to G4 levels, which would be a severe geomagnetic storm, at least temporarily. So we'll see who ends up being right. I'd be uh, surprised by G4 storm, but not super surprised. I think G3 is probably what we have in store for that. And as a result, we have some Aurora coming in. Let's check it out. And here we have our Aurora view line for tonight, December 7th, and also for tomorrow, December 8th. We see the Aurora pushing down here to the southern border of Canada, and we're getting Aurora all the way in the northern states according to this model. It could push further south, especially if the Germans are right with that G4 forecast. But in general, if you live in these areas, you may wanna go out at night and point your camera north, long exposure to get some perhaps red and green colors. Some of that air glow that's closer down to the surface, you have to look north though to, to get that. So very likely on the night of the 8th for the United States and Canada, we are going to have a geomagnetic storm unless that impact is coming in slower than expected, in which case that would push that to the 9th. And if it's a longer duration geomagnetic storm, uh, then that could also extend out to the ninth as well. So there is quite a lot of viewing opportunities for those in these areas. And if you're really far south in the Southern Hemisphere, bottom of New Zealand, very Southern tip of South America, maybe down to South Africa, you could also have some Aurora viewing opportunities over the next two nights.
So that's your space weather and earth geophysics update. I've been your host, Stefan Burns. Thank you all so much for watching. Please smash that thumbs up button, help this channel grow. And if you'd like to stay up to date with what is happening with the earth energetically, then please subscribe. We cover what's happening here. So earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, geomagnetic storms, severe weather events. We also, of course, look at the sun. You need to if you want to understand what's happening here on earth. So solar activity and solar cycles. We look at planetary resonances, alignments, interstellar forces like comets and more so if you like the sound of that then please subscribe hope to see you around wishing each and every single one of you well i hope that if you're in an area that has the ability to see aurora that you get out there and have some amazing viewing opportunities i myself am actually thinking about jetting up to alaska for this event so let me know what you think about that would you like me to go to alaska and do perhaps even a aurora viewing live stream Comment below. I'm making my decision in the next few hours. So like to hear from you on that. Thank you all so much. Have a great day and I'll see you all in the next video.